Today we begin a series of teachings on the prophet Jeremiah. We just couldn't capture everything in one week. There's so much material. Did you know that Jeremiah is actually the longest book in the Bible? There's more words in Jeremiah than any other. And of course, the events that take place during the life of the prophet, the things that Jeremiah speaks about are so significant in the life of Judah, the Southern Kingdom. And so we are going to spend a little time, but today I thought I'd give you just sort of an introduction, a few of the highlights about Jeremiah that'll help you to place what he's saying in the times in which he's saying it. will help you understand just why his prophecies were so significant when they were first heard and why they're significant for us today. Now, you probably are familiar with many key verses in Jeremiah. A few of my favorites are, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with unfailing kindness. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Or this is what the Lord says, cursed are those who trust in mortals, who depend on flesh for their strength and whose hearts turn away from the Lord. My personal favorite, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's a beautiful verse. And there's so many in Jeremiah that really we could preach a thousand sermons on Jeremiah alone. I'm not going to do that, at least not today. So what was happening during the life of Jeremiah? This is really important because you cannot understand Jeremiah and his prophecies without knowing what was going on around him. And a lot was going on around him. Excuse me. <coughs> the Near East was dominated by three powers. You had Babylonia, Assyria, and Egypt. They surrounded Judah, essentially. And these were three powers that had reached tremendous strength and were vying with one another for control of trade routes and of agricultural products. And Judah was right smack dab in the middle of everything. So Judah often would align itself with one or the other of the powers at one time or other. It would take its, hedge its bets on one or the other powers overcoming, overcoming and hope it picked the winner. It did not always, certainly not during Jeremiah's time. Now these various smaller groups such as Judah or city states or small countries were very much pawns in the struggles that the trio, the big three, Babylonia, Egypt, and Assyria would dominate. I'm gonna give you a few touch points, a few dates in the history of this geopolitical struggle that will help you to understand a little bit about Jeremiah and why what he said was so radical. Here, here it goes. Hang with me. Again, a lot of dates, a lot of facts, but just get the general idea. Okay, we're ready. First of all, in 622 BC, you remember Josiah ascended to the throne of Judah. Right before he did, the Assyrian empire began to fall, leading to a bit of a power vacuum in which Judah experienced some relative peace. So the first years, especially of Josiah's reign, were relatively peaceful. Into this vacuum, though, the Neo-Babylonian empire would start to rise and the Egyptian empire would start to gain strength as the Assyrians lost strength. When Assyria fell, and Babylonia was starting to rise, Judah, under Josiah, it seemed somewhat removed from the world powers and had a period, as I said, of autonomous rule as a state. But it was the last period of such rule that Judah would experience. Meanwhile, Egypt was attempting to expand its influence up into Judah, and they made an alliance with Babylonia to try to force out the last remnants of Assyrian power. As they did so, they were actually defeated on the plain of Megiddo, Egypt was, where King Josiah, not, excuse me, not Egypt. Egypt, see this is so confusing. Egypt was victorious. 
Judah and Babylonia and Assyria went down. Because King Josiah had made an alliance without inquiring of the Lord against Egypt. And when Egypt took over, they replaced the king's son, Jehoaz, who they took into captivity after several months and put his second son as the vassal king on the throne. And Egypt plundered Judah's treasuries. Meanwhile, Jeremiah is speaking through all of this. And we'll see that more when we look next week about the kind of things he was saying while this was going on. But that's not all. In 605 BC, other changes began, other shifts in this power structure. Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, defeated the Egyptians. He then was seeming to be the big man on the block. But Judah's king Jehoiakim, sensing that Babylon was rising, changed his loyalty to the Babylonians rather than the Egyptians and became Nebuchadnezzar's vassal king. In other words, he sold out the loyalty of his people to Nebuchadnezzar for protection. Nebuchadnezzar solidified his rule by taking vassal kings and hostages, appointing a vassal king and taking hostages with him back to Babylonia. And this is the deportation that we read about where Daniel and his friends were brought, the first deportation brought into Babylonia. This was again about 605 BC. In 601, however, the Egyptians conquered the Babylonians. Can you keep this straight? And Judah's king Jehoiakim quickly switches alliance from Babylonians to the Egyptians. We've gone Assyrian, Babylonian, now Egyptian. In December of 598, Babylonia made an attack on Jerusalem, leading to Jehoiakim's death and the surrender of the city to Babylonia in March of 597. Nebuchadnezzar replaced Jehoiakim after only three months of reign. He deported the king and 10,000 leaders, this is the second deportation, from the city. He looted the city of Jerusalem and he placed Zedekiah, Judah's vassal king, on the throne. In other words, Zedekiah was reporting straight to Babylon. Now Zedekiah was a weak king and he repeated the errors of those who preceded him. And he actually became convinced to now change alliances from Babylonia to Egypt and to revolt with some other states. Tyre and Sidon are some of them against the direct advice of Jeremiah. We'll see more of that later. And Nebuchadnezzar came back and defeated and totally destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC. I told you it was going to be a wild ride, but I want you to remember about all this is that Jeremiah lived through these tumultuous times. Jeremiah spoke directly about the alliances that the kings were making, about the weaknesses of the nation being spiritual as well as military. Jeremiah prophesied when his words were needed and often were neglected sometimes even violently. So when, what about this life of Jeremiah? Now we've seen the culture where he lived, the, the milieu in which he existed. But what about him? Well, first of all, he began his ministry at age 20 in the 13th year of King Josiah's reign. <coughs> Again, that would be 626 BC. His name, Jeremiah, means Yahweh establishes or Yahweh lays the foundation. Pretty good name if you're going to be a prophet. God commanded him directly to write down the words that he spoke to him. He didn't choose to be a prophet. He was called to be a prophet and his calling was absolutely clear. And he then chose to accept that calling. Jeremiah used a scribe called Baruch to write down the words that he would dictate. But Baruch had quite a role as a um, best supporting actor in the story of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was of a priestly family, Levite family. He lived about three miles northeast of Jerusalem, though. 
He may have been well off financially since he was able, we read later on, to buy the estate of a bankrupt relative. We don't know for sure, but we know he at least had some funds at that time. Josiah offered protection to Jeremiah for a period of time and had good relations with him. But not every king and every ruler that served was the same. After Josiah's death, Jeremiah was persecuted by the rise of an idol-worshipping faction in Judah. The tide turned. Jeremiah was still protected by a few God-fearing elders and, and princes after his messages against the nation, but he had been forbidden to, to go into the temple precinct, so he was able to deliver his next prophecies only via Baruch, to whom he dictated the words that were written on a scroll that was presented to King Jehoiakim. King Jehoiakim did not like what he heard. In fact, he had the scroll destroyed and Baruch would then go on to prepare another copy. King Zedekiah, however, the next king, allowed the nobles even to arrest Jeremiah as a traitor and encourage the nation to submit to Babylon. And after the fall of Jerusalem, although Jeremiah was offered a place of honor by the Babylonians because he had urged the Jews to submit to them, he chose to remain behind with his people in Palestine, to remain in the ruined nation and ministers to those who had remained after the deportation. However, after the murder of Jedediah in chapter 41, we'll read more about that, Jeremiah was taken off to Egypt by fugitive remnant Jews who feared Nebuchadnezzar's wrath. And in Egypt, Jeremiah would die after a few years. There's a, pro there's a proverb that the Chinese say frequently that is both a blessing and a curse. And the proverb goes like this, may you live in interesting times. For Jeremiah, it was a blessing and a curse. He lived in very interesting times. And to complicate that or compound the problem, he had an interesting job. He had to bear witness to God in those times and speak boldly to princes and rulers who would not welcome his words. There are three things I want you to observe as you read the text, as you read the scriptures in Jeremiah especially. One, it's not written to be read chronologically. It's not chronologically constant, unlike some of scriptures. It is not a strict record, A happens, then B happens, then C happens. It's not intended to be that way. It's not written in a linear fashion, but the prophecies are often grouped by theme. So it takes some unwinding or unraveling to understand exactly when Jeremiah preached particular prophecies. A good study Bible or notes will help you with this. Secondly, Jeremiah's messages were given during difficult times of stress, upheaval, and need. And his words, again, as I said in our first part of our lecture, reflect that struggle. Number three, the book demonstrates multiple stages of development. In other words, at different times of his ministry, Jeremiah and his scribe Baruch assembled the prophecies and rearranged them in definite patterns. So we, what we have today in our Bible was assembled and then rearranged later by either Baruch or someone who followed Jeremiah. Very closely to, close to his death though. And it's very dependable. The themes of Jeremiah that I want you to keep in mind and look for these as you do your reading this week and the next few weeks. Number one, Jeremiah is warning, warning Judah of an impending judgment by God. He's warning them and warning them and warning them again. Number two, he encourages or exhorts his people to repent and to obey the Lord. The Lord is not giving up on his people easily. He is asking them to come back to him, come back, come back. And he preaches that through the prophet Jeremiah. Number three, in order to precipitate judgment by confronting Judah's response to her final warnings and pleas for repentance, 
Jeremiah will preach faithfully. He will actually preach in a way that will bring them to respond to these final warnings and to suffer the judgment of God. And the other theme is that Jeremiah is predicting and warning and historically recording the fall and the hope of Jerusalem as well as surrounding nations due to their disobedience to Yahweh's word, to the Lord's word. I hope that this kind of quick, kind of date, name laden introduction uh, will help you to understand a little bit more about Jeremiah as you read it. And we'll, like I said, we'll be in it for a few weeks. We'll focus a bit more on his messages and the events of his day during the times to follow. Um, feel free to <laughs> listen to this again and take notes on dates and times, or look again for a good study Bible with a chronology. It'll help you so much if you understand what was going on at the times when Jeremiah was speaking. Again, I am grateful to be able to bring this lesson to you. I am grateful for your faithfulness in listening and in responding. I get many emails and texts from you after, and I appreciate that for responding to my teaching. You are a very <laughs> precious part of my life. Thank you. God bless you.